Welcome back to our side where I'm Mike Revin. It is the channel that is dedicated to helping you get through those cybersecurity exams that you need to get to the next level. Every week, I take the request from below to select the next week's videos. We're continuing through the CISSP exam, Domain 3. So when it comes to encryption, it really is about the basics. Everything about encryption is focused on confidentiality, to hide something. To encrypt, I take my plain text and turn it into ciphertext. I have two choices to make, either symmetric encryption or asymmetric encryption. With symmetric encryption, I have the same key on both sides. With asymmetric encryption, each individual gets what is identified as a key pair. The strength of a crypto system comes within the cipher itself, as well as how it is employing certain elements. So you'll have stream ciphers and block ciphers. Stream ciphers break down the data into individual bits. Block ciphers break the data down into 64-bit blocks. One of the ways that we add complexity to our ciphers is by employing confusion and diffusion. It is how it sounds. Remember, everything about these exams, it's a grammar test. So confusion, to be confused, mixed up. Or diffusion, taking something small and making it big. You've seen a diffuser. It's the little vase with the oil in it and the bamboo sticks. It takes the fragrance of the oil and makes it big. Next, we deal with hashing. Now, when we deal with encryption, it's all about confidentiality. When you enter into the world of hashing, it is all about integrity. It's simply there to ensure that the receiver can validate that the information in the data was not disturbed in transit. Remember, a hash is a one-way function. It takes a variable length input and puts it into a fixed length output. When we speak about certificate authorities, we're generating a hierarchical trust model. The certificate authority helps us to validate the authentication, provides us the ability to perform digital signatures, and overall encryption itself. It is one of the core components of the PKI infrastructure. Next, you'll have registration authorities. They are as they sound. They are the interface from the user to the certificate authority. The easiest way to think of the PKI infrastructure is simply the DMV. Think of all the elements it takes to get your driver's license. First, I have to prove, for instance, my age and who I am. Generally, that would be done with a birth certificate and a social security card. The DMV doesn't own either one of those documents, but they've set up a trust with the individual organizations that provided those documents to be able to assure that I am who I say I am. Next, you'll take a driver's test and a written test. Generally with the driver's test, you have a state trooper in the passenger seat. Why the state trooper? Well, because who better to know whether you know the rules of the road than the police that police the road. And then finally, your written tests, generally administered by the DMV themselves. Everything about the process of getting a driver's license or a certificate meets the overall requirements of the PKI infrastructure. It's all about separation of duties and least privilege. No one organization or entity can perform the entire act without the assistance of another. Following along through the DMV analogy, now we need to figure out how we're going to revoke those certificates and how people would know that a certificate is revoked. Well, if we think about it, who would have the power to revoke a certificate? Probably the court system. The court system will say you have too many points and we're going to suspend or take away your license or your certificate. They will publish that to what we know as the OCSP. OCSP, the Online Certificate Status Protocol, will then be accessed by the police officers when they run your license. That interface would be what we know as the CRL, or the Certificate Revocation List. See, it really is as simple as remembering the DMV. If you remember the elements of the DMV, you understand the PKI infrastructure.
Some of the ways used to defeat our crypto systems are known plain text attacks, chosen plain text attacks, and chosen ciphertext attacks. They're pretty easy to remember because they are kind of as they sound. A known plain text attack, the attacker knows the unencrypted content and then forces it through the crypto system to be able to capture the ciphertext. With the chosen plain text attack, it's very similar to the known plain text attack, except this time the attacker is choosing the plain text to push through our crypto system. And then our chosen ciphertext. Simply, the attacker chooses the ciphertext that the system is going to process. A few of the methods used to defeat passwords are a brute force attack, which simply is random guessing, or a dictionary attack. There are multiple dictionaries that you can download for free that all have a common theme. For instance, there are dictionaries with every character in the Quran, or every character in the Bible, every American football player, every international football player. Depending on the target would depend on the dictionary that you choose to use. And then finally, rainbow attacks. The rainbow attack takes those dictionaries and then hashes them. And then you'll use the hash of those passwords to then attempt to break the password. Next, let's walk through some of the different types of malicious attacks that we need to deal with, such as SQL injections, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows, or session hijacking. All of these can be mitigated by one technique, input validation. So you will be expected to know the differences between a SQL injection, a cross-site script, cross-site forgery, buffer overflows, and session hijacking. SQL injections simply abuse this SQL language to attack a backend database. Whereas cross-site scripting attempts to inject a script in a website that's intended to be executed by another visitor to the same site. A buffer overflow simply attempts to overwhelm the computer's memory, forcing a system crash or a DOS effect. And then finally, session hijacking is simply taking over a networked conversation for their own purposes. And again, remember, all of these can be mitigated by simple input validation. In any field that you will only accept, for instance, a phone number, it should not accept any more than those nine or 10 digits. Or for a field that's only supposed to accept a birthday, it should not accept any more than two, four, or eight characters. That brings us to cyber physical systems, industrial control systems, and SCADA systems. They're all fairly similar with some minor differences. When we talk about cyber physical systems, generally we're talking about things like uh, defense systems or healthcare systems, whereas industrial control systems uh, conceptually are the same as a cyber physical system, except used in a more industrial application. And then finally, SCADA systems. Most all SCADA systems are focused on infrastructure. One of the more popular attacks on a SCADA system would be the Stuxnet virus. That's going to do it for part two of domain three for the CISSP exam. We have one more section to go. This is the largest domain in the entire exam. In the next section, we'll be talking about things like physical security, keyloggers, and skimmers, as well as some different governance models that you need to be familiar with. Again, remember, this is a community-driven channel. If you're enjoying the content that you're getting, hit that like button and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And as always, visualize success and you will succeed. I'll see you next time.